a second. Okay. Welcome everybody. Welcome to the April uh, Caprock Writers and Illustrators Alliance meeting. We're very glad that you're here. Um, I have a couple announcements before we get into our program today. We have three different, very diverse and unique uh, speakers today. We're starting with Jennifer Archer. Um, she's going to give us a, a spiel on increasing book sales with better covers and blurbs, and it is a fantastic program. Um, she's also got a handout that we're going to attach to the video. Um, so Mathis, when he puts the video together, we'll have it in the comments where there's a, um, a Google Doc where you can get the the blurb from her uh, presentation. Then we have Dan Duane. He's here and he's going to be teaching us a technique on how to paint with bleach. Um, and then Jane is going to talk about creating with Photoshop the graphic novel drawing effect. Um, but I want to pitch our next couple of meetings so that you all know what's coming up. We're really excited in May. We have Jonathan Aaron Baker coming. He is uh, used to be an agent at a big New York agency, and he does a lot of um, uh, freelance writing now, but he's going to present to us the do's and don'ts of querying agents. So any of you that are looking to get an agent or are just curious about the process, that's what we're going to be covering. And he's a he also is a stand-up comedian, so he's going to be very funny. I think oh. that should be, uh, I've seen him speak at a, a presentation that I was at, and Kim and I were both like, we got to bring him on. So I think you'll really enjoy his presentation. Um, and then in June, that's in May, and uh, that is May 8th at 10 a.m. June 12th at 10 a.m. We have, we are going to come back to the Garden Art Center. We will be live. We're gonna um, hopefully have a little get together ahead of time just to kind of reacquaint ourselves with each other. And we'll give you more information about that soon. But on that day, we have Tom Nichols, who used to be the chief of police for Tucson, Arizona, and also here in Lubbock. And he's going to be talking about espionage. He writes crime novels. He's got a crime border series uh, and also a, a series of uh, espionage books. So it'll be really interesting to hear his take on all of that. Um, and with that, we've got other programs throughout the summer. Keep checking our website. We're going to have it updated with all, everything that we've got planned for the year. Um, but with that said, I'm going to pass this along to Jan, who will introduce uh, Jennifer Archer. All right. Well, I was lucky enough to watch her video um, when I got home uh, this week, and it's quick, concise, to the point, and it's stuff we all need to know. Jennifer Archer is the author of numerous fiction and nonfiction works. Her women's fiction novels have been nominated for Romance Writers of America's prestigious Rita Award and Romantic Times Book Club's Reviewer's Choice Award. In 2013, the Texas Library Association selected her debut young novel, Through Her Eyes, for their first period of Texas reading program. And that's quite an accolade right there. Jennifer enjoys teaching creativity, as you can see when you watch this video, and creating write, uh, writing workshops. She also writes and edits for clients through her business, Archer Editing and Writing Services. She lives in Texas with her husband and three dogs. She has a website at jenniferarcher.com if you want to check that out. Hi, Caprock writers and illustrators. My name is Jennifer Archer, and I'm really happy to be here with you today. Before I start the presentation, I just want to give you a really quick um, little bit about my background and my writing journey. I sold my first novel back in 1998 to a traditional publisher. Self-publishing really wasn't a thing back then. And since then, I've written and sold romance novels, women's fiction, young adult novels, and a small amount of nonfiction. If you care to take a look at my work, my website is jenniferarcher.com. I also uh, currently have a writing and editing business for clients along with my son Ryan, and it's called Archer Editing and Writing Services. The, uh, the name of it soon to change to Archer Productions. And if you'd like to see what we have to offer, our website is archereditingandwriting.com. What I wanted to talk to you today about is your cover and your back blurb or, you know, the copy that's on the Amazon sales page for your book and on other retail outlet sales pages and how that can all affect your sales, either negatively or positively. 
and toward the end of the presentation I'll be talking a little bit more about one of my books that um, I got the rights back to it along with some other of my books in the past year and a half and I decided that I was going to self-publish those books and one of those books went from selling practically zero books for several years to on average 20 books a day consistently and that was after I changed the cover and the title and the blurb and um, you know just had really good luck with it but um, I didn't start with that book that was a book that I did after I'd learned some things I started with a uh, three book series, uh, a humorous paranormal women's fiction series that I had the rights back to. And um, I decided I was going to give those a facelift and self-publish those. And I made so many mistakes. I mean, I just made just about every mistake that you could possibly make. But it's my hope that through sharing what I've learned since then, about covers and blurbs primarily that I can help you not make those same mistakes. All these things that we're going to talk about now apply equally to ebooks, paperbacks, and hardbacks. Now I've always mistakenly thought that the cover of a book should reflect a scene from the book or one of the main characters from the book. When I set out to design the covers for this uh, three book series without doing my research, um, told my cover designer that I wanted the focal point to be the heroines of the three books. I wanted the heroine of book one to be on that book and book two, that heroine and book three, that heroine. That was gonna be my focal point. Also, um, because my books were humorous, paranormal women's fiction, I, took it upon myself to decide <laughs> without research that I wanted the humor to be the focus of the cover. I just thought that would be a really cute look to have kind of a uh, cartoonish um, uh, cover with the woman on front. And so these were big mistakes, but I didn't realize that at the time. And she, my designer made some really cute covers and I love them to death. I think they're just really cute and beautiful, but they don't fit the, the category for my books. Um, even though my books are humorous, the primary focus of the story is the paranormal element. And they fit most in that category. It's better with book covers to blend in rather than stand out. And I know that goes against everything we're told about everything else in life. You know, we tell our kids and everything that it's uh, being different is a good thing, but not with book covers. With book covers, you want to look um, like all the other book covers pretty much in your category that are at least that are the best sellers. And why is that? Well, the psychology behind it is that when pe readers go online to shop, they're going to be drawn to book covers that look like books that they've bought in that category in the past that they've enjoyed. And the reason for that is um, if a book stands out as really different, um, that's a risk, you know, and, and they're not willing to risk their time and their money on something that's so different that they might not like. And so whether or not they realize it or not, psychology has shown that, uh, that that's how readers are when they're shopping for a book. How do you make sure that your book is a fit, your book covers a fit? For your category. Well, first of all, you do what I didn't do and you do your research and you start by deciding what category is the main fit for your book. Okay, that's the first step. Once you have that figured out, then you go and you look at the best sellers in that category. And the way you can do this is to go to Amazon, find the category bestsellers. They have bestseller lists for the different categories that they have on Amazon. So go to that page and look at the top 10 or 20 or 30 or even 50 bestsellers in your category and look at what they have in common. And now there'll be a few that don't fit with the others that do stand out, but look at the majority, the majority of the bestsellers and see what they have in common. And you can start by looking at the background color. Is the background color dark? Is it light? Um, is it, um, you know, what are the main colors that are used?
Um, in my category, paranormal women's fiction, you see a lot of dark blues, you see a lot of dark purples, you see black. Um, so the colors are really dark. Um, look at the tone. What's the tone of the cover? What does it convey? Does it convey humor? Does it convey, you know, fun? Is it bright? Um, does it convey magical, a magical feel, a mystical feel? Does it uh, convey horror? Um, so what do the majority of the covers in that category convey in tone? Also look at your title, the title of the book. Look at the typeface, how big are the are the letters in the title how big do they tend to be on most of the covers look at the font style is it you know are the letters a block style font are they more of a um uh you know a dramatic font that has a lot of flair and you know curves curves in the uh lettering and swirls and that sort of thing look at the color of the font in the title you know in my category there's a lot of white titles. There's a few gold titles. Um, so look at the color. Look at those very same elements in the author name. You know, most most of the time the, the title and the author name are not in the same font and not the same size. And so look at those things and in your, in your author name and see about that. Also look at placement of the title and placement of the author name. Is the author name at the top or the bottom of the cover? Is the title at the top or the bottom? Um, note where on the covers the majority have those. What is the most common focal point? Is it a person, a character from the book? Is it a, an object? Is it, um, uh, you know, some don't have a focal point. Some books in certain categories have a really big title and then just the background, maybe some texture. So see what's common, most common in your category in the paranormal women's fiction. It tends to be an object. Also, if there is a focal point object or person where are they on the on the cover are they in the distance is it centered you know is it up close and personal look at that um in my category it tends to be an object and it tends to be centered do most of the covers in the bestseller uh, list of your category have an, a, a review quote on the cover that's something you would want to emulate. If they, if they, most of them don't have one, I wouldn't put one on there on your cover. So now let's take a look at the covers of my paranormal women's fiction series and see how they compare to the bestsellers in that category. Okay. Well, as you can see, they aren't a good fit at all. I love these covers, as I said, but they aren't doing me any favors sales-wise. So as you can see, the background color is more pale. Um, it, on most of them is more of a pale color. The second book was a little darker, but the other two are, are more pale and bright. Um, the tone of the covers is upbeat and fun and, you know, not the moody, magical look of the bestsellers. The title and the author name, I did get right in the positioning, but I got, I, I was totally wrong with the coloring, okay? My author name's in black instead of white or gold like most of the bestsellers. Um, the font style is off, so the focal point, totally wrong. I've got a person as the focal point, and I think there's only one book in the top sellers of the category that I've found that have a person on the cover. Um, overwhelmingly, they have an object. Um, I have a review quote on each of my three book covers, and that's not common in my category. So, you know, I, I really bombed out as far as, as far as designing these covers, even though I love them, you know, they, they, like I said, they're not doing me any favors. So now let's talk a little bit about blurbs. You also want to turn that book over and look at, at the blurb and, and not only the blurb on the back of your book, I'm also talking about the sales copy on your sales page at Amazon and the other retail outlets. A lot of times authors use the same thing they do on the back of their paperback book, but you don't have to. But you want to make sure, especially on your sales pages at your retail outlets like Amazon, that um, if your 
most of the books in the bestseller list on of your category are written in first person. You write yours in first person. If they're in third, you write yours in third. Now in my category, they, they're almost 50-50. 50 percent -50. of them are in first and 50 percent in third. So if that's the case, you look at how your book is written, the story, and then follow suit with your blurb. If your book is written in first person, it makes sense to write your blurb in first person as well. Also on your blurb, answer the same three questions that your novel should answer. And, and those questions are, what does your um, protagonist want most? What obstacles stand in the way of him or her getting those things? And what is at stake if they don't succeed? Now, if you have equal, two equal characters, and you know, like in a romance, sometimes you have a a point of view character that's female and an equal point of view character that's male, you'll want to answer that, those questions for both of them. Now, I know that these things can seem a little nitpicky and irre irrelevant, but the fact is that your cover blurb, if, if your cover blurb and your cover confuse your reader, they aren't as likely to buy it. For instance, you know, with my books, readers are looking at the cover and thinking this is a rom-com, you know, this is a romantic comedy. But then if they go so far as to read the blurb, they're like, well, this sounds like a paranormal romance. You know, which is it? What is this book? And that's confusing. And you don't want to confuse your reader because they're less likely to buy that book. So what do you do if your cover's all wrong? Well, it can be a difficult pill to swallow. It was for me, but you might want to think about redoing those covers. And not everybody's got a lot of money to just up and redo their covers. Fortunately, we do have places now, really great places where you can get your covers online inexpensively, but still get good quality. And one of those places that does pre-made covers um, actually for $25, a lot of them, is called um, getcovers.com. Getcovers.com. You might want to check them out. Now, the covers are pre-made, as I said, so the only thing that they can change for you or do custom-wise would be your lettering, your font um, for your, your author name and for your title. The artwork will remain static, but this particular site and a lot of other you know quality sites online are really have done a great job of doing their pre-made covers that fit the genre and the category really closely so you can look through there and find what fits when it's when you only are spending twenty five dollars or a little more on a cover then you can you can you're not going to break the bank you know see if in three to six months your sales go up and if they do, you've got a winner. Or if they stay the same or they drop, you know, then you can always go back to your prior cover if you like it better. But now let's take a look at the book I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, and that's my standalone women's fiction novel. And um, that's the book that went from selling really zero books for years under the prior cover and, and title and blurb to selling on average 20 books a day consistently. And that was after I changed everything, the title, the blurb, the cover. Okay, there's really nothing spectacular about this cover. I mean, it's a nice cover, but not spectacular in any way or, you know, um, but it fits really well in its category. It's not perfect. <laughs> I was still learning when I did this, but I had learned a lot already. The subcategory this fits best in is Mothers and Children, which is under women's fiction on Amazon. That's a category. And as you can see, here's the top bestsellers in that category. And it really fits pretty well with that. It doesn't just jump out at you like my uh, series jumped out among those dark, magical looking covers. So um, it blends in pretty well. And this is the one that, I mean, once I made these changes, that book really started to sell. So I wish I could tell you that I came to all of these realizations on my own, but I did not. Um, when I got serious about marketing and, and realized I had a lot to learn, I found a course, a free course online. It's Brian Cohen's uh, uh, five-day Amazon ad profit challenge. 
and it's a free, as I said, it's a free course. One of the best, not one of the best, the best free course courses I've ever taken. And in it, he, you know, it's, he calls it Amazon ads and you do go into that very extensively, but he also covers really everything about marketing for a self-published um, author. And um, I highly recommend it. He gives it once a quarter and the next one is this month, April 12th, it begins. But I really highly recommend that. It's made all the difference for me. I really hope that this has been helpful to you and that you all sell a lot of books. And if you feel like you need some help in the writing or the editing of your books, I hope you'll reach out to me through my website, archereditingandwriting.com, and I'd be happy to, to talk to you about your project. And we do offer a free consultation. So it's been great talking to you today. Happy writing. Okay, have we stopped sharing? Did I get it stopped? Okay, I have to go back through my screens to see where I'm at. All right, good. <laughs> Excellent advice. I see some things I've got to change now too because of some things she's mentioned here. So, uh, but excellent advice. And glad to see our other people coming in now. <laughs> um, who are we going to do next? Is uh, Dan up next? Uh, Dan is one of our board members here, and he has also been a teacher for many years, and he designed his own book cover. And we're going to show a little video of his process called bleach painting. And Dan, do you want to take it from here? And do you have the link already up, or do you need me to show it? Uh, if you want to go ahead and uh, show the link, that would be fine because I really don't have it up. I oh, could go fetch it, but I, it would take me a little while. I've got so it. So why up. don't you do that while I talk just a little okay. bit? Okay. Okay. Uh, today, I'm, my presentation um, is about a painting style. It's it's tactical. It's actually doing the painting. And uh, Jan, you may want to mute just a minute. Okay. And um, it's, it's going to challenge some people and, you're, and they'll think, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. First of all, it, it, it involves some drawing and, and I just can't draw. Oh, I can't do that. Listen, this is not something you're going to do for a college professor or for a grade. You're doing this because you are developing your own artwork. You're, you're working towards something that, that you like, and you're probably working from photographs. So my, my suggestion, as far as drawing is concerned, is to find the photograph that you're going to use, and you may composite several so that it becomes a collage of sorts. But take the photograph and then scan it. On the back of the paper, just rub carbon. Just take your pencil and just rub carbon all over the back of the paper. It's where it's kind of black. Then lay it down on the paper that you're actually going to use and trace it. Easy as that. And once you trace it off, then you have your drawing that you can start with to develop the painting. And the painting is, is really a lot of fun. You may want to do two or three of them to come up with one that you really, really like, because the first one you do is going to be a sample. You, you're experimenting, you're, you're exploring something new. And then after you do another one, you'll be going, hey, I'm getting a handle on this and you'll do something beyond that. So even though it's something tactical, it is actually painting and drawing. Don't let it befuddle, befuddle you. Just go ahead and say, I can do this because I have a scanner. I can change the size of this on my uh, photograph using paint or whatever. And then I can just scan it, uh, print it off on my printer and put that carbon on the back of it and trace it. And then lift that off and you've got your picture there. Take another one, do that put it in another location, trace it off. And before you long, you've got a whole collage that you've drawn. Well, sort of drawn. 
but it's no different than taking photographs and moving them around. So as we begin the, the drawing, I want you to also realize that this is a bleach painting. Now using bleach, you may want to use goggles and a mask and that's perfectly fine. I've done this technique way before we had all these precautions that people started taking. And, you know, if people got it on their skin, we washed our hands. And it's how many have ever gotten bleach splashed on them when they were doing laundry, okay, or whatever. You wash your hands. It is something you just naturally know you have to do because it's a corrosive. Don't let it just sit there and, and ignore it. But um, we found that today there is a bleach that is very thick. It's called non-splash and it's easier to work with. It um, is always diluted. Everything that you're seeing in this video is diluted bleach, okay? So you put water with it and you can cut it in half. You can cut it by a, a quarter or a two thirds and you will then paint with it accordingly and apply it in layers so that it bleaches out instead of trying to put the straight bleach on. Um, that's not only a little safer, but it's also keeps you from drastically changing the paper before you get to your final project. And you'll see it as we go. So I think it's time to start the video. process I really don't know what it's called I just call it a bleach painting um, but as we do it and you may see that I've drawn in several um, pictures on this this colored paper this is plain mat board this one is a Canon product um, it's not poster board it has a tooth to the feel but it cannot be marked as color fast. If it's marked as color fast, it will not bleach. So, and this one is just a textured um, cardstock, which it bleached out very, very well. I sampled each one to make sure that it was going to lighten. This one lightened to a kind of an orange. This one was more of a yellow, and this one was. Um, almost white when this one was bleached out. So each one and the paper will have a different final color that they bleach to. So you, you'll want to kind of uh, use the right paper for whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, you may decide that blue paper is better than the brown. I just like the look of the brown with this, pro with this project because when you get through with it, it has kind of a sepia look to the whole thing. And I really liked that. Um, now today I'm going to put the the flower pictures aside and I will work on this one. This is in fact a drawing from my book cover and yes I'm probably, a, not probably, definitely um, doing a little bit of um, advertising on my new book that's coming out soon but um, in doing this, I'll show you that you can create the image and um, make it appear somewhat different, but you could actually turn this into a book cover if you wanted to. There would be no reason you couldn't use the final image as a book cover. This one, I just like the blue, and this one will be more of a sepia tone when it is finished. So. I have that already drawn out, but I'm going to leave it right over to my side so that I can look at the light and darks as I, as I paint. Now I will have to get ready with my bleach and I will use a dropper. I'm going to put water in the container closer to me. And I'm going to put 
bleach and the one that's farther away. Now, it is bleach, it is a corrosive, and if you feel more comfortable using rubber gloves, that's fine. You can use rubber gloves, and because you're using a paintbrush, um, there's not as much tactile uh, expression to it as if you were actually drawing with a pencil. So you're going to find that it's going to be one of those things where it would be perfectly fine. I've done this so many times, I never get it on me. So I'm not really worried about it. And it doesn't splash. And there is even this new bleach on the market that is the splash proof that we had found that was really cool. However, I found that the best bleach for this project, the very best bleach, was the um, cheapest bleach you can get. Uh, some of the name brand bleaches, it took longer. I don't know what it is that they put in there that keeps it from actually activating quickly, but it just takes longer for the product to actually bleach out. So let's get started. We'll use our paper, um, select a brush of your choice. I like flat brushes over round brushes for the most part. They Round brushes have their purpose, but I'm going to get started with a flat brush. Now, the style of this is going to be pretty much a um, as if you're doing a line drawing. And so you're going to make a lot of the lines in um, the direction of your, that one has water in it, in the direction of the drawing itself. So I'm going to start here and start with Now remember, I'm, I'm drawing the light, and in drawing light, because of the way that it works, I can come back and take more off with the bleach, but I can't put more back on. So I have to be more careful with the subtraction process than the addition process. I really like doing hands-on um, artwork, and I do a lot of computer art as well, but there's just something wonderful about doing the project in its tactical form where it actually you actually have the painting to start with, and then you photograph it and turn it into your book cover. As you can tell, I'm starting starting to get a different variation in the in the tonal qualities. I'll come back in a little bit and get a little bit more of that going. But you want to do it slowly, and you don't want to, you want to take your time with it. You don't want it to start developing too quickly, or it'll all turn light right in front of your eyes, and you've lost your image. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes just getting some bleach on this paper.
hope everybody found that to be very entertaining. Um, the uh, drawing part, and there was the drawing on that paper. I just didn't just paint it, although you couldn't really see the lines very well. Um, there really was a drawing on there that, that I got started with. And I, I had actually done exactly what I told you about. I had made a copy, put the graphite on the back, and traced it off so that it looked uh, to scale because that's the hard part about drawing sometimes is getting everything to scale and make sure everything's in the right place. So, Excellent job, Dan. And uh, am, am I muted still? Okay. No, I see I'm not. All right. Uh, I wish I could paint that fast. That's for sure. <laughs> I see yeah, me too. I would show. love to paint that fast. <laughs> that's just wonderful. That's cool. And I'm also very flexible. I don't know how much time we have left for our, our time today. If we need to show mine some other time, I'm cool with that too, because we've gotten a lot of good art stuff today. Yeah, I think we should play it because people that are watching the video can always pause and come back to it. I really would like to have it captured and you're, okay. you're, we're getting the writing elements, we're getting the art, and then we have the computer design. So I think it's a, a really good mixture. All right, very good. Well, we'll get started on my screen then. Um, I did want to say something. Um, I love graphic novels and the, the thing I'm going to show today is how to create now my favorite graphic novel, of course, is I, I consider Calvin and Hobbes to be the greatest uh, literary work of all times. It's brilliant <laughs> writing. It truly is brilliant writing if you, you catch his drift on so many things. But graphic novels, my students would give me these and uh, I guess to get an A for class, you know, <laughs> this is uh, uh, you, you know, you see things from different angles, but I had a technique that I used in Photoshop that would turn um, any photograph into a black and white image so that it becomes graphic novel effect just by using Photoshop. So I will show you it's a just a 12 minute video or somewhere about there and we will go ahead and share screen right now. Hi, it's Jazz here. I'm a retired instructor, but I still love working with Adobe Photoshop. Now, there are lots of new phone apps and other software out there. For instance, uh, a good example is Photolab that will turn your photos into very similar looking caricatures such as these with just one click. But I find I can still get a lot more control with Photoshop. And since I am sometimes a control freak, this is the demo you get for today. Now I used a program called Adobe Fuse and Mixamo to help me build the three-dimensional characters that you see here for my book cover. But Adobe just sold Fuse to another company called Steam and once they have all those bugs worked out I'll give you a fun demo on those tools. But for now if you do create graphic novels I hope you'll like this simple step-by-step -step tutorial. Step one you want to take a good photo and open it in Photoshop. Now, a good photo, just something not taken from a long distance away that's not in focus. You want everything to be in focus. You want to have some good lights on it, not a lot of hard shadows. So that's step one. Step two, you want to save the photo with a new name before you apply any of these effects. And the reason why? You don't want to accidentally save your original photo with all these changes. So I'm going to go up to File, Save As, change the name of it so I've got my original and then I'm just going to take that off and change it to something totally different. AAA sounds good. Tell it save at maximum. And that's step two. Step three, you want to duplicate this background layer twice. So when you've got it selected, come back under layer, tell it duplicate layer. First one, you're going to name it top edges reason why this will tell you that that is the top layer and you're going to put edges on it and then you select on background again and you can either right mouse click or you can go back up to layers but you can duplicate layer again and this one we're going to call it bottom because we're going to have two layers one's going to be a top one's going to be a bottom we want to know that this is the bottom layer and it's going to have color so they need to be in this order top edges up here bottom down here okay that's step Step 4. With top edges, 
selected, you're going to go to the Filter menu and under Filter Gallery, so come on up here, Filter Menu, don't, don't click on this top one because that's just going to apply the Filter Gallery you had already used previously, but you want to come down here to Filter Gallery here and let this open up. Once it opens up, you're going to go into um, Expand the Artistic Folder, which it is expanded right now. Click on it and you can see it expanded. and you want to go ahead and if your image is not showing in the middle here you can hit your little minus button here until it shows up in the center and then we're going to put in poster edges and we're going to put the edges in at 10 you can just highlight across it type in 10 or you can drag the slider make sure you've typed in 10 now you may want to look at it I think the edge intensity needs to be 10 posterization needs to be at 2 and tell it OK Step 5, with top edges still turned on, we're going to turn it into a black outline image. So click Image Menu, Adjustments, thresh Threshold. So Image Menu, Adjustments, Threshold should be down about halfway down. And we're going to change this to 49. So type in 49 across there and tell it OK. Still got a lot of lines within it, but that'll disappear later. Step 6, now we're going to be using a dry brush effect on this, so under top edges, even though we've already turned it into an outline, we're going to go back up to the filter gallery and go to dry brush, so come down to the middle filter gallery, open up till we have artistic opened, and then we're going to click on dry brush right here, and you can choose anywhere from 7 to 10. Again, I'm going to hit my minus key in here. You're not going to really see much of the effects happening here because we've already turned it to black and white. And I'm going to put 7 here, 10 under brush detail, and 1 under texture and tell it OK. And this may seem a little bit redundant uh, because we'll be doing this later on our bottom color. OK, we're through with top edges for now, so turn that little eye icon off. Let's see, it's a little sticky there, so that we can see our bottom color, but we also want to select on our bottom color. So that is step 7. Step 8, to reduce the amount of color, we're going to select the bottom color, make sure it's highlighted, click Filter Menu, Gallery Filter. So Filter Menu, not the top one, but down here, Filter Gallery, and then we're going to go to poster edges on it also. So poster edges, I'm going to hit my minus so I can look at the poster edges here. And again, I'm going to put 10 in here. Well, I'm going to at this point I'm going to put 0, excuse me. 0 here, 0 on this because these are going to be multiplied later. I don't want to see my edge on the bottom layer like I saw on the top one. So and 2 under posterization, I'm going to tell it okay. Step 9, with this bottom layer still selected, we're going to go to Image Menu Adjustments. So Image Menu Adjustments, and then we're going to go to Levels. So up here, whoops, if I can get it here, Levels. And we're going to go ahead and just move our bottom slider slightly in. This will just help reduce the contrast a little bit. You, you can see how much I could reduce it. I don't want to reduce it that much. but I want to reduce it a little bit. Now that's all uh, up to each artist. I'm going to go ahead and tell it OK right there. Now step 10, with the bottom color layer still selected, we're going to go to Menu, Adjustments, Hue and Saturation. So Image, Adjustments, Hue and Saturation, right about here. And we're going to turn our saturation, we're just going to type in 40 right here. That gives it a bit more color saturation. Alright, step 11, with the bottom color still selected, we're going to go to the Filter menu up here, Filter Gallery, remember down in here that we get it, and go to Dry Brush. And we'd already put Dry Brush, I'm going to hit my minus, I kept zooming in on that. Um, we'd already put Dry Brush on the top layer, now we're going to put Dry Brush on the bottom layer. And you can put brush size anywhere from 7 to 10, anywhere on your brush detail from 0 to 10 and then as I slide it back and forth you can see the the slight difference and texture again uh, you can slide it around uh, there's not a lot of difference at this point I'm going to tell it OK leave the texture at 1 
Okay, step 12. We want to go ahead and turn this visibility on the top layer back on and we want to select on it and we want to then change the blend mode to multiply. Right now it's on normal. Here it shows normal. We click on this little arrow and we find multiply. Multiply kind of lets us see down beneath the layers. Alright, so that's step 12 and we have one more step to do. Step 13, with top edges still selected here, you want to go under Layer Adjustments. So click on the Layer Adjustments button down here at the bottom. Click on that until it opens up. See if it's going to open. Here we go. And then you want to click on Levels. So come up to Levels here. And then watch what happens as you take your slider and move it slightly. You get a little d more depth, a little dark, more dark. You can come back in. You can change your highlights, your mid mid ranges uh, to get exactly what you're wanting in your graphic art look. So you slide it around to you to where you've got what you want, and uh, and then click OK, and you're ready. Let's see. I may just turn that back down. I like a little bit more color. Okay, I'm gonna click just anywhere in the middle of this to bring it back up. If I wanted to do some final. Uh, touch up, like if I didn't like quite so much line in the face here, I could take my eraser tool. As long as I'm on top edges, I take that eraser tool and I can erase some of the dark lines and it will just leave, it's allowing us to look at the posterized image, color image below. So again, if you if you got a little bit too much texture in there, you can you can finally erase those like that. Okay, and there you go. Now here's one final thing I want to show you. You've already got your graphic novel effect here, but if you wanted to do real caricatures of politicians or whatever, you could take this a step further. Now my high school students loved this. They enjoyed going in and doing this. But before you do it, you have to save it as a JPEG so that it flattens the image, so you've got this image to work by. But go into Filter Menu, go down to Liquify, and let's take a look at all the things that Liquify will do. It takes it a second to open up here. Here we go. Um, I can use, we've got several tools over here. I love the bloat tool. You can also uh, come over here. You can change the size of the eyes if you wanted, uh, make them bigger or smaller that way. I don't usually use these over here, but the same with the nose, the nose height. You can bring it up or, or down, um, nose width, widen it. But you can do it with the bloat tool too. And you can scroll down through. You can see you can got the mouth. Um, other things that you can work with. But I'm going to show you this bloat tool. If I were to choose to select, and you can change your brush size. I've got it at 243 right now, which seems to be about right. So I'm going to move it back up there. And I'm going to click on this eye. And you can see, just by clicking twice, I've enlarged my eyes a little bit. I could do even more. One, two, three clicks. One, two, three clicks. And I kind of have a surrealistic look here. I could go back down to my mouth here if I wanted. And I could put a smile on, a cheesy looking smile. <laughs> and if I wanted to, I could use my pucker tool to even make my nose smaller. I could hit here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, and then I kind of have a George Bush nose there a little bit. But uh, you can characterize things quite a bit by just playing with these. And like I said, the high school kids just loved working with this. They had a lot of fun. I'm on the bloat tool now, just kind of swirling around a little bit of the, the hair to give it a little bit of difference. So uh, have fun with that too if you want. And that is my demonstration. Hope you enjoyed it. All right. I hope y'all had fun with that. It's just uh, one, two, three, step by step. And there is a handout on that, too, if you forget the, the steps to take on that. Um, I know we do have some graphic novelists out there, and and uh, it's it's something I enjoy. So anything, any questions? I have a question. How long did it take you to learn Photoshop that well? <laughs> well, <Hundreds of> <laughs> I, I taught it, and that was, a, I remembered that from a lesson I taught many years ago, and of course things have changed, but yes, when you teach it, you tend to learn it really well, but yeah, there's a lot to Photoshop, and like I said, there are newer programs out there that will, uh, I've seen uh, 
is photo lab that does it immediately, but you don't get all the control. And like I say, sometimes I'm a control freak, but plus I've always taught Photoshop. So I tend to want to go back to what I know. It's just easier not to have to learn something new all the time. So have you ever Jim. used the software called uh, GIMP? It's a, it's open source, like a replacement for Photoshop and it's free. If not, so I will put that on my list of things yeah, to explore. It's nowhere near as good as Photoshop. My daughter wanted Photoshop, and I was like, yeah, I saw how much it costs. So, and she's got a little dinky computer, so I was like, I don't even have to run. But so we we downloaded GIMP. It's it's similar. It does similar things. It's definitely, yeah. she she's studying uh, Photoshop in school, and so she's like, it's not even close. But for those of us who are cheap, <laughs> but are interested. Yeah. <laughs> just, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah great job. That was interesting. Dan, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, uh, I was going to say that, um, I learned Photoshop to actually, um, work for KMAC KLB, KMAC KLBK television. I was the art director there for several years and Photoshop and I became uh, really good friends, but, um, I think that I learned a few things in that video that I've never used before. So you're a good teacher. That's awesome. Oh, well, good. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you Canva is another thing that people may look at online. It's a different kind of thing. It's not it, like it doesn't do what Photoshop does. Can I love Photoshop? I use Photoshop all the time, but it is a simpler pro, uh, program that some people may want to use too. Okay. And it's canva.com. It's a free app. Uh, it's not even an app. It's a website that you can go to and save your projects. And um, it's it, for those of us who don't know Photoshop and uh, don't have like all the, the detailed skills on that. It's an easy way to put something together. It doesn't have as many tools, but it's free. And it's it does have it's really good for doing, you know, like lettering and it's ads and things like that. So um, uh, Steve says he uses book brush because he still has some time left on a subscription. Yeah, I've looked into book brush too. It, it's really good for helping you create book covers and book ads and that kind of thing, but it costs money. And uh, the free version was a little clunky, but yeah, it's another good option, book brush. Okay. Um, okay, so Dan, how long did it take you to do the full artwork on that? Um, uh, Jan, I don't know if she's listening. Oh, yep. What do you think? How long was that? You were over here about a... Oh, you I don't know, maybe two hours. I, I maybe think. two hours, yeah. Two hours, okay. That was a really fast, condensed version of that. Yeah. Well, yeah, we didn't need to sit two hours and watch you, but it was I made me think of um Bob Ross, you know, the, the curly hair and the squirrels and stuff. I was like, oh, we can I started to wear my curly hair today. Yeah. Yes, you should have worn it today. But no, it was really fun to watch you do that. I feel like um I I, I had an art minor and I like have lost most of my skill, but I do feel like I want to try that. That looks like a lot of fun. Different colored papers, let's kind of see what happens. And do you have any sense if like you put it in the um, if you put it in the sun, would that bleach it more or is that too much with the rest it, of the paper? It will bleach a little bit in the sun. This is the uh, final project. I don't, can I get it to where it will show there? Well, right there. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. So now you can't see my mouth, but you can see the picture. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Turned out um, good. yeah, but if you actually left any, any of those in the sunlight, for extended period of time, you're going to see a, a difference in the value change. Anything that's marked fadeless will not bleach or will not change in the sun. I mean, it will, but it just takes a whole lot yeah. to make it do it. So um, I this project, like I said before, it works on like red paper, um, blue paper. And a lot of people love the blue look, kind of gives it an underwater look, you know, and um, maybe clouds and stuff like that. But I really like that sepia tone. I think it gives it an old fashioned kind of old timey look. And yeah. I like that. Yeah, it turned out did, great. Did you use that at your book signing at the library? Because uh, that's nice to have that kind of poster off to the side, too. You know, I think people would be fascinated with seeing that along with your books and the cover that you came up with. I had an ad campaign that I developed on Photoshop uh, with Photoshop and uh, I had lots of posters up, um, but um, they were all 
of variations of different um, people or even those little artist dummies that you can manipulate and they're reading my book and it's, it's really fun. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and the, my favorite one, all the images came off of Pixabay. Pixabay is wonderful for images. If you don't know what Pixabay is uh, actually KJ turned me on to Pixabay and um, I take all my images from there. It's uh you can use them for commercial purpose. They're licensed. Uh, it's kind of a license free, I guess, but it actually it says that you can use it for any project, commercial project or whatever. And um, I'm going to um, put a picture in chat, which is one of my favorite ones that I developed uh, with pictures from uh, Pixabay. And let me see if I can do that. File, um, computer. And, and to be clear, Pixabay is a royalty-free site, um, pixabay.com. Yeah, that's what I was trying to find. That's and there's also pexels.com. You do have to look at each image. Some of them have requirements that, like, if you use it, you just need to give them credit on the, the inside of the cover if you use it for commercial purposes. Other and, ones don't have anything. So you just have to be careful, and you want to make sure you're not going to get in trouble with uh, copyright law. And some of them you have to buy, and some of them you don't. Most so, on Pixabay, there's no purchase, but you do have to be careful how you're using it. If you're making money off it, most right. of the time it's fine, but you just need to read each picture has its own little things. But anyway, I want to wrap up. So Dan, did you put it in there for us to see? Let's see. I did. I don't know if it's showing or not. It says that um, it is sent successfully, but I don't see it. You have to download uh, it. Oh, there it is. So you got to click on it and then it'll to, come up on your yeah. on your screen yeah then you can save as and yeah, then you can save, save as yeah okay well good i wanted to kind of wrap it up we're a little bit over our time slot but as a reminder um please come to our next meeting on may 8th at 10 a.m uh we did have a little issue with our links today so we've come up with a plan to make it simpler we're going to use the same link for each meeting going forward so you should be able to click on any of the pat you know any any link from the next meeting on and it should work so we did have a, a few issues but anyway may 8th at 10 a.m will be another zoom call because our presenter jonathan aaron baker lives in maine and he's not going to be here so it will be another zoom call he is presenting the do's and don'ts of querying agents he has been with a big new york publishing company um, and he was a literary agent and so he's got great information he was also a uh, stand-up comedian so he's really funny um, we've seen him at a, a couple different events Kim and I and thought he'd be great to come on so come with your questions he's going to give us some some really good tips then on June 12th we are going to return back to the Garden and Arts Center we will have our hopefully have the rest of our meetings there and also have a, a zoom meeting um, we're trying to get they don't have very good internet at the site. So we're trying to figure out how to do a live Zoom call while we're doing the meeting, but it might have to be um, a video on YouTube afterwards. Uh, that's our backup plan, but we would really like to do both so that people that Zoom in can ask questions and be a little more integral part of it. Um, then, So that's on June 12th. Our, we're hoping to have a little bit of a um, yeah, phone hotspot says, Steve, we've looked into that and, you know, we have to test it out. We just haven't solidified all of those little pieces and we're afraid that it'll turn into a disaster. So we want to make sure it goes well before we offer it. Um, anyway, so the June 12th meeting, um, we're going to try to meet a little bit before that. I'll give you more details soon, but we'd like to have like a little welcome back, have maybe a meet and greet in the morning before the meeting. The meeting starts at 10. It will be Thomas Nichols. He used to be the chief police here in Lubbock. He was the chief of police in Tucson, Arizona, and has written a bunch of espionage and border crime wars books. He will be talking about espionage during this meeting. It's going to be fascinating. He's a brilliant guy, great writer, has a lot of really good books out there. Um, so I'm hoping you all make it to those two. Um, we will be updating our website with all the meetings that are coming up um, so that you can kind of look ahead and see some. We've got some great people coming. Um, Dorinda Jones. We have um, several other people that were still in the works, but 
we're excited. We've got lots of good things coming up. So stay plugged in. Um, are there any questions? Does anybody have questions about anything before we sign off? I don't believe so. Thank you everyone for joining us. It has been a lot of fun having you here. And this video will be up if you've missed the beginning. The beginning of our program was Jennifer Archer, who uh, has, she's got uh, lots of different awards, including the Romance Writers of America and some other things. So she had some great advice on book covers and blurbs. So if you missed the beginning part of this, please uh, check out the video when it releases in the next couple of days. You can find that on Amazon, I mean, on Facebook. <laughs> and also if you go to our YouTube channel, which is under Caprock Writers Alliance. Thank you everybody. And we will see you next month. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Take care.